the more your law firm grows, the more people it can help. Or put another way, the only way for your law firm to grow is for it to help more people. Either way, if you believe you have a gift, then I sincerely hope you will grow your law firm so that you can share your gift with more people. While Arjun was away, Team Arjun came to play. All the cats out of the bag now, folks. But we're still here bringing you our favorite and most importantly, actionable insights to Arjun's newest book, Profit First for Lawyers. We're going to help you accelerate your law firm's growth so that you can experience more profit in every aspect of your life. We're also going to be providing some behind the scenes footage of what it's really like to work with Arjun Robbins. So put your BS aside for the next few minutes and put yourself, your family, your firm, and your profit first. Welcome back to another episode of the Profit First for Lawyers podcast. I'm your host, Carly. Today, we are sitting in the studio with Superwoman herself. This is Allie Leibovich, and she is the co-founder of How to Manage, and also she happens to be married to Arjun. Allie, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much, Carly, for having me. I'm usually totally behind the cameras. So being here, it's like, ah, what am I doing? (laughs) <laughs> You're fabulous. So, Ali, for those who don't know, can you give us a little bit of the history of how did you and Arjun decide to start How to Manage? Um, how did all that come to be? Okay. So, um, Arjun had been doing How to Manage and different versions of How to Manage for many years before I joined and the new How to Manage was born. Um, he was already consulting and had a couple of versions of the business. And he started doing a lot of speaking engagements. And he had basically an, like a director of operations that ran um, that business that suddenly had to go away. And Arjun was on a trip, on a speaking trip, and suddenly he's like, Ale, I need help. Like, I like get in there and do something. So I jumped in and I basically ended up going to real life business school, <laughs> which um, I didn't know anything at the beginning. But um, from listening to all of his teachings, I started immediately listening to everything and going through the workbooks and using it in our own business <laughs> so I could take over. And um, I was very always technically proficient. So I started working with his team and um, moving things along and creating technology that uh, let us scale the business. What we needed and what the business needed at that moment was to to be able to uh, scale. So uh, I had been working in my professional life as an artist. I had worked in launching TV networks and TV channels for other countries. So I was used to much bigger projects and working with a lot of people in countries and productions and creative uh, projects. So I, to me, it was a tiny business. So um, I needed to <laughs> put things in place. So things weren't manual and um, and we could use all of the resources that we had uh, for scale, for to be scalable. So uh, when I say I went to real life business school, I'm not kidding. Um, started immediately reading books, taking classes of all kinds, and going to a lot of workshops as an attendee, and at the same time, learning to host workshops and learning from the work the, the workshops that I attended so I could run hours and started to hire events people and the whole operations and events team so that we could run these, uh, these events, these workshops, these um they started as one day, then they went to two days. Then we started with the first live quarterly meeting uh, for our members, which right now, at the, I think we had 17. Yeah, I think it was the first one with 17 members that that, um, that came. 
And then, and now that is tiny, like our team meeting is 200 people. It, it was, it was just tiny, but for us, it was, uh, it was something amazing to be able to meet the members in person and not just be doing at that time, everything was over the phone and the conferences, like it was like Zoom, but only with audio. And uh, there was one tool that we used for uh, video, but that was something completely new that most people weren't even using. And so I started building basically operations and events so we could run everything that um, we needed once Arjun and the rest of the advisors started teaching uh, the different lessons and the different courses. It's hard to picture it snowballing from that, to be honest. Like, I, you know, because I've, I've been to some of the more recent live quarterly meetings where you have 500 people who rush the doors as soon as they open. And it's, it's hard to, to even imagine like the first one only having 17 people there like that. It's such an intimate group. <laughs> uh, Team Arjun ourselves are almost 17 people strong at this point. <laughs> yes. Um, sometimes we laugh because uh, we pass a lot. Uh, the new Our new office is one, two, is basically two, block, two and a half blocks from where the first lab quarterly meeting was and from where the first office, from where we were working uh, when, we, when we started, we were living in that same area. And, uh, and we passed through that hotel and we just can't believe it. We all laugh with all of the members that there are, there are many of those members that are still with us <laughs> from those times. And I remember Heather, we, we had this overhead projector to show slides because they, they are where um, that's what was available. So um, I remember that Arjun wanted to do the slides, so just write them on, in, in person. He didn't want to prepare them and print, it, and print them. I don't he was going to write them? Yes. So he did. But then we realized, oh no, we forgot to get the pens. So then I <laughs> Heather, one of our members that is still with us, like she said, I have one, like I have one of those. So then she grabbed it from her purse and threw it. And then that was, that was it. We started and that's how it all started. <laughs> You know what I love most about hearing these kind of stories, though, Ali, is that, you know, a lot of times I feel like when you when you scale a business, it starts to become less personable. Um, but the the vibe that you're feeling, you know, uh, oh, no, I don't have a pen and somebody throws it to you like that, that same helpful community vibe is still very much alive, even with the live quarterly meetings that are 500 people strong. And I, I think it's so impressive that you guys have built this kind of community that is um, helpful, kind. I mean, obviously you have the, the no asshole rule. Right? Yes. Assholes, not welcome. <laughs> I love that so much. So Ali, you do work a lot with the members directly and kind of coaching them up and, and helping them to get through some of the BS that has been holding them back. Can you speak a little bit to what what kinds of things are you hearing? What kinds of pitfalls have you coached members up from that maybe our audience can learn from so they don't repeat similar mistakes? The main thing that I see is that they are not thinking about profits. They, they are not. You would think that they would, but I think that the, the doctrine of sacrifice has a lot to do with it, which is something that I learned from Arjun myself because from where I came from, and in, in, I guess in the art world, the idea of, of sacrificing and not getting paid, it, it, it doesn't exist. It's just, it's not like, it's not part of the lingo, it's not part of the culture, it's not expected. It, it was something that I learned and that I started to see and, and it's real. Doctors have it too. There are several professions where I see that this doctrine of sacrifice uh, really gets on the way of them, of, of the professional being able to help other people. Because when you are 
sacrificing yourself and not getting what you need and not having what you need and not getting from enough rest to having enough money to sleep well at night and to be able to pay for your kids' schools and activities and college and vacations, having a good life, that gets in the way of you delivering uh, services. I remember one when we started hosting masterminds, this is a long time ago, I remember that uh, one of our members, he wasn't a member yet, but then he became a member of that mastermind. He would not hire a housekeeper, okay? And there was this whole, his wife was there too in the mastermind and they were having like like issues and he would, he would refuse to, to hire a housekeeper and like no that is an expense and this is this is this we see this especially with the firms under 250 even under the 500,000 you see this that they do not want to hire anybody they want to do everything themselves and they um Arjun made the member clean the toilet in the hotel like clean the toilet and then come back to his um his hot seat where we were there to talk and work on his business, right? And like everybody was like kind of mixed of laughing and horrified by that at the same time, having him, him, not the wife, himself do the cleaning. And then he finally, that's what it took for him to understand that if he's cleaning his own toilet or letting his wife cleaning his own toilet and cleaning everything, in what kind of mindset is he in the best mindset to help a client and to be thinking while he's cleaning poop? Like, is that the best mindset that he can have to like think in the problems of his of his clients and help them? Is that the best mind cleaning poop of <laughs> of uh, about your own business? Right? It is not. It is absolutely not. So that goes for. Um, answering the phone, doing everything themselves. Today, I was having a call with a, with a, um, one of our members and he was talking about uh, his business model and that he was changing it and that he was going to be doing these fast and easy estate plans. And he was planning in, he, wa- he had been doing the intake um, in his firm, which is something that, um, somebody else should be doing because that is basically an hour, hour and a half that he was spending that he's not charging for it and that it, he he's not giving legal advice either on that and that it, he, he's doing because he wants to because he wants to clean his own toilet right it, that is not, he does not need to do and then he was planning on going himself to the houses of these uh, his clients to deliver the papers they have in them signed. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, no, it's, they are not thinking in using their time in, with profit, like in a profitable manner. And they are not thinking in their life in a profitable manner. They are not thinking that if they get paid what they deserve and they get paid handsomely so they can have the life that they want and be happy, they won't be able to be in their best best state of, state of mind to solve the client's problems. So that is the, the main thing that I see. All of the decision-making, um, I was explaining to him, there are these levels of thinking, right? So there is ground level, where basically you are, it's all tactical. You are working on the email that you're working right now. You look at your calendar and it's the next hour, the afternoon, and you live in that in that altitude, right, of thinking. And then there are 5,000 feet, 10,000, 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet, you are uh, not so much tactical, but no, you're not fully strategic. You are thinking more in, 
what is my monthly goal? Like what, it, what needs to be accomplished in the week? What my team has to accomplish? And then up to about three months, right? That is where pretty much all entrepreneurs live, right? Unless you are late and you spend 80% of your time uh, reading and being in strategic in 50,000 feet, right? And uh, that's, where, that's where he spends the time. But the rest of the entrepreneurs that are actually the heads of their businesses, they really spend the time at the 15,000 feet where it's, a, it's in the middle of tactical and it's in, in, in the middle between fully on strategic. And he, this, this, this member, he was basically leaving, making, all making his decision making, all at ground level, at tactical level, at thinking of today, and not thinking in what is his monthly goal, how much he should be making every week, how much he should be making every month. So he actually hits the goal that he said he wants to hit, right? And I see that a lot. I see the business owners, the attorneys, they are not being profitable because they, they keep putting themselves at ground level instead of being at 15,000 feet to to at 15,000 feet to about 30,000 feet where they should be operating. That's where they, they can do better decision making. If they are, they have to think in the strategy of a case of how they are going to solve it or in this state plan, how is this going to be laid out? So it makes sense for tax purposes and everything that all of the problems that the client has, the most profitable way to do it is to be at 30,000 feet, right? In that altitude where his mind is fully strategic, but cleaning poop in the toilet, that is ground level. That is not 15,000, that is not 30,000. And I see them very much more like operating very low altitude. And that is the opposite of profitable. Oh, I, you know, that's a, that's a really different perspective on, um, asking yourself, is this the highest and best use of my time? You know, it is really thinking about it from that level, like you said, right? Like if I'm on the ground, can I be strategic? No, I cannot. You know, I, I've got to get up to a satellite. I've got to get up to an airplane in order to see all the ground before me and actually have goals. Not only to have goals is to actually be working on your goals because ground level, you're not working on your goals. You're, you're working on the task that you need to achieve. They don't, they are not even thinking about the goals because they can't like, they can't take off. They are all the time at ground level. So that is basically the opposite of profitable. It's the most unprofitable that they can be as a CEO of their businesses. What, what advice do you usually give to the members when you notice them sticking too low on the ground? Like, is there, is there a practical step one, step two? Like, first, you got to get somebody else to do this. They get very angry at what I, I tell them to do. <laughs> they don't like it at all. What I tell them to do actually is to spend more time learning. So I tell them to basically get out of your office and go and do that. And basically, but they are like, but when am I going to work? You're not going to work. You should be thinking and you should be giving work to other people. And the more, the busier that you are and the least that you're working on the business, the better that the business is going to go. They, like I have to remove themselves from being physically doing work, giving them other things to do that they resist and resist and resist. But I, I explained to them that we grew at the speed that we grew and we keep growing because we travel a lot. We are not in the office. We attend as much as we give and we teach we also attend and we're constantly at attending. I'm enrolled at um, Harvard Business School and I'm taking um, classes there. So I'm traveling a lot and I do uh, work during the week uh, for my classes and I do it anyways, at the same time as doing other things. So I end up delegating more and really using the best use of my time is when I'm the more strategic and uh, avoiding avoiding at all costs to do anything. Yeah, avoiding that busy work 
or the work that could get done by somebody else who can't be as strategic. Yeah, so I send them out to do to attend classes, to attend um, that they they come to workshop Palooza and they, they attend physically the the workshops and that they come to the live calls and ask questions and they get upset because but I'm going to use these 90 minutes of my time and then we start going through what they spend their time on and it's like you have too much free time like you have plenty of time to do that plus to do this other thing where the thinking and the 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 teaching is strategic thinking in those calls, so they will elevate right their their altitude and their thinking, but they resist to do it. Why do you think that is? Is there is there a particular mindset that really ties them to the ground? Yeah, control. They think because they don't put in systems to track what is being done in the fronts because they don't want to see how is what are the results of the employees, the, of everything that is happening. They don't want to see the data. They don't want to see the numbers. They avoid seeing that. If they are doing themselves the work, then they are in control. They think they are in control. And when they have to delegate, they feel the first thing that they feel is that they are out of control, that they are not controlling what these employees are doing. But all it takes is to teach them what they need to look at so they know that their job is being done and it's being done well and it's being done well every time they they um, need to create manuals they create systems they create technology that does different things so it shows them how everybody's doing you know it's kind of funny that you say that though because my former executive used to talk about the the good old battle days of uh, very early on when he had started his business. And he said that his biggest roadblock to growth, which he didn't, he couldn't see at the time. He could only see it through the lens of his current self, right? But the biggest roadblock that prevented him from growing was the fact that he had to be over the shoulder of everybody that he hired who stepped in to do the work that he used to do, but had grown out of doing, or in other words, you know, he was, he was so concerned on making sure that they would do it the way that he would do it or to the quality that he would do it, that he wasn't actually focusing on other work, which is what he hired them for, right? He was just focused on, on them and on correcting them and trying to make them do the exact same work that he was doing. And he said that he realized once he kind of let go of that stranglehold um, that, that he realized that they were never going to do the work the exact same way that he was going to do it. They were never going to do it to the standards that he, well, not to the standards, but to the, to the um, exact quality that he was going to do it. And when he let go, they actually did it much better. And the, that was something that was really hard for his ego too <laughs> at first, you know, like I am not a writer, but I hired a writer and I micromanaged the writer. And then when I stepped back, the writer did better writing than I could have done. <laughs> yes. They think, um, uh, they, they really think, I think everybody that, that, um, the first time that anybody is going to delegate and, and, and have an employee is going to think that they are better at it and that they can do it better. And there might be one, two things that they might be better at anybody else doing it, but the rest, they're not. And it takes maturity, entrepreneurial maturity to accept that you should be hiring. Part of being profitable is hiring people that are way better than you are at everything. And that they think different than you think because you don't know what this there are so many more creative things or different ways of doing something that you didn't think of that they think of and makes things sometimes simplifies sometimes it makes things more complicated and that doesn't work it's hard to when they simplify something and it works fantastic it's great but then when it doesn't, when it makes it worse, or when, when the work doesn't get done, 
then that's a problem. And they don't, because, because they didn't put in place things that they can look at uh, to know if the work is being done, they learn too late. And then they go back in and they do again the, the job and then to get them out again and to, and to hire again. I think that what I tell them is when that is happening, they are at ground level or maybe at 5,000 feet. And then once they go back up and we manage to give them wings and they start flying, but like, you know, and get it, gaining altitude, then they are like, oh my God, I got to hire this person again. I got to do it better. Okay, how do I do it better? And the moment that they ask you, how do I do it better? Then we are at 15,000 feet and we can talk again. But sometimes it's just impossible to talk to them. You know, I, I really like that perspective too. And and I think, you know, one of the things that I've noticed as I've been interviewing um, a, a lot of other law firm owners who have uh, been using Profit First, right, is um, some of the most regular feedback I got was that, you know, I had a really hard time getting started because it seemed selfish to put my profit first ahead of my clients or my employees or whatever. Um, and then I realized, obviously, I wasn't putting those, I wouldn't wasn't putting my profit above these other very important things. I was using the profitability as a tool to, to do it better, to serve my clients better, to uh, serve my employees better. And I found a, a really cool clip from Arjan. And I wonder if um, it's super duper short. It's like 20 seconds long. Uh, I wonder if we can play it. And I'd love to hear your feedback on it. Cool. Let's do it. Okay. Let's roll that clip. The more your law firm grows, the more people it can help. Or put another way, the only way for your law firm to grow is for it to help more people. Either way, if you believe you have a gift, then I sincerely hope you will grow your law firm so that you can share your gift with more people. Okay. Short, sweet, and to the point. Perfect. Um, today, for example, I ended this call with this member telling him exactly that, basically that if he didn't help this, this particular set of clients that he is uh, helping, they will be vulnerable and nobody will help them. And he needs to help them. And having that need of helping those people is what's going to grow his business and make it profitable. But he, without, without his business growing, they will be vulnerable. Nobody will help these people. And bad things will happen from that. And it is, I think it took us, I'm trying to think when we learned that lesson. It was early on maybe a year after, I don't remember where we were, that we finally understood that, that concept that we needed for us to grow, we had to help more. We needed to decide on the business model and how many people we could help. And everything is easier if you have less people, right? So how do you keep the systems and the everything basically operationally from collapsing when you are doubling like a hundred percent that you're doubling every year? Every quarter you have a business that is between 25 to 30 something percent bigger than you had before. It's kind of crazy. And you think you can be ahead of the game and build and build, but um, it's it's a lot of work until you um, you hit a level where you can hire, you can attract your big enough. And this is something that I wish we would have listened to other people and hired hired really pros earlier, so even though they were much more expensive, like their salaries, their comp packages. The thing is that it was a mix of us being afraid of that at the beginning. And also we weren't attractive enough for 
to have that team because the team, the A players, they have to want to come to you, to work with you. You don't attract them unless you are an attractive company, right? Then you're going to be fun and you're going to be um, a good place to work. And you have to hit a certain level, like you have to grow enough and pass those years until you are big enough, not only to help more people, but also to attract the team that then allows you to go big and to help a ton more people. It's hard to understand. And I think that once you can see it in their, in, in their eyes and in their results, when a business owner, when, they, when the attorneys, when they figure that out, when it, it finally hits home, because you can tell somebody, you can tell somebody, you can tell somebody, they won't hear but at one point, you keep repeating that they they will be in the right place to mentally, right? They they finally took off and they went up, and then they can actually hear you and believe you that is possible until they hit a certain size, and then they can hire a team that can handle and can help them scale to help a ton more people, and then the business becomes truly profitable. Ooh, I really like that thought. And Alan, you know, it's so funny because when you when you think about, you know, the the more that I focus on um, making sure that my business is profitable, the more people that I will help. Right? It it feels like no, that's not true because all of the messaging, you know, kind of does say like we we've kind of been spoon fed it, and I can't even think of like a specific source. Just like a if you work harder and if you you know uh, try your best to help more people, then the profit will just come. Arjun calls it the the uh, what is it the the magical farm elves <laughs> will just come and it will automatically happen. But it makes so much more sense when you put it from that that really um, I don't want to say math perspective, but but a really intellectual perspective of the more profitable you are, the more people you can help, the bigger your company grows, the more rock stars that you can hire, the more that your company can help. So like if your goal is to help more people, the best way to do that is to focus on being profitable. Absolutely. And um, also profits attract profits. Because of the doctrine of sacrifice, they, they, they think that they have to sacrifice and not charge what they need to charge so they can have the profit that they need to have. So they can do not only profit first, but to be profitable as a business. And the choices they make, they keep, they make the choices of how they spend their time of, of, um, they use the doctrine of sacrifice not only in their businesses, but in their lives too. And they are finally able to liberate, right? To get to get freedom from that. Then the, the profits, they it's like a 10x, like a 5x, like a 20x of, of how suddenly it's not only the business that becomes profitable, then it's also their life. They end up applying profit first to their lives too, not only in their businesses. They start taking the vacations that they've been, they, they start going through their bucket list and they start actually living, right? Which is the idea of profit first. And they once they, they get used to doing it in the business, then you can you can get really, get them to, use that same concept, but for living. And then that's when the companies, that's when you attract the rock stars. You know, Ellie, there's one other thing, and I, I'm hoping that you would be willing to share this with us because I, I have gotten so much out of this particular episode. One of the things that um, Arjun says in Profit First for Lawyers is that he wrote the book to be a rallying cry for entrepreneurially minded small law firm owners. And I'm so excited that you're here because you and Arjun have your own rallying cry, don't you? Can you explain a little bit to our audience? This is one of my favorite stories. Okay. Okay. So um, we were, I don't remember, many, more than, way more than 
maybe 15 years ago. I don't remember how many years ago, but it was a long time ago. And um, I think it was the last time ever that we went to IKEA. Um, I don't remember. I think that we moved offices, something, something we moved and we needed bookshelves, whatever it is that we needed, desks. I think that they had the up and down desk, something. We went to see them and we were then in the cafeteria um, eating something. And I remember the it was overcast and you can see it's very high up and you can see there is like a, like a top golf that you can see with people playing. It's like very expansive, the view. And um, Arjun was frustrated because of uh, whomever he had been talking the day before um, on uh, members. And at one point he said, I wish they would just take all of their excuses and shut them up their ass. So then I, and then we keep talking. And then I remember having like that pen from Ikea in, a, in my notebook on the, with the measurements of the office of what we need to buy. And I, 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 I kept like that, take all your excuses and shut them off your ass. Like it's just stuck with me. And then I wrote it down and then I started to, I kind of just look at it. And then I realized that if I took all like the first letters of each of each of those words, I came up with taille as to ya. Take all your excuses and shut them up your ass. And I guess I don't know, from copywriting and designing, like that, I just like that that sentence stuck with me that was something special, right? So then at, at one point I look at him and I'm like, I tell him, Taye as to ya. And he's like, what is that? So then I show him a piece of paper and that from that moment on, that became our motto. And that's when we decided to like, we went, we went already all in, but we went like, it was like a rocket ship. Like that, like it, like we just took off because that became anything that would happen, Tayastuya. And Tayastuya became became our motto and then later on the name of our son. <laughs> <laughs> Which then how do you top that? Like how do you have a stake on one and then you name them, right? Like I don't know, like like Kevin, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I love it though. It's beautiful. Does does Taye know what his name stands for yet? He does. He does, and sometimes um, he tells us. Like for example, if he wants to go to Five Guys, right? Like to have a burger, or if he wants to go boating, or whatever is that the thing. And then we say something that sounds like an excuse. He's like, "That's an excuse." Taye Stuya, and we. So he he uses it against us <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh kids are so good at calling us out <laughs> oh, it's kind of become the rallying cry for some of the members too and in fact i have a video from the july live quarterly meeting with a bunch of members just giving us their best taya estuya that would be i would love to see that do you know what taya estuya stands for take all your excuses and shove them up your ass take all your excuses and shove them up your ass take all your excuses and shove them up your ass take all your excuses and shove them up your ass take all your excuses and shove them up your ass <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Allie, I'm so glad that you came on today. I, I got a lot of insight here. And I, and I do think that that rallying cry has a lot of, you know, it, it really ties in with everything else, right? If you're, if you're on your ground level and you're making excuses, why you can't get those wings and sort and be a little bit more strategic, tie yes to ya. Tie yes to ya. Allie, I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much for taking your time. And thank you so much for inviting me. This was fun. I'm That's so cool. glad. We'll have to do it again in season two. Yes. And I hope that uh, this episode is very profitable. 
<laughs> Me too. Hey, folks, that's what we've got for you today. I hope that this has been really uh, chocked full of actionable insights that you can go and take right now. Feel free to adopt this rallying cry. Tie us to ya, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Profit First for Lawyers. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, tell a friend. And buy your copy of the book at ProfitFirstForLawyers.com. Your future self will thank you for it. And we will see you next time.